And behind this question, Miss Lengel adds, is her hope you might consider in future some Wagnerian roles, such as Elsa, Elizabeth, Sieglinde, Isolde. First, it's a great pleasure to be on this wonderful broadcast, Richard, and to be with you again. In answer to the question, I really um, do not have a specific role that I am interested in uh, doing right now. Um, I do not really think, although there are some areas of the vocal apparatus that lends itself to excerpts from the Wagnerian um, repertoire. I do not think that my, my vocal um, attributes lend themselves totally to a regular diet of Wagner roles. Um, first, I think the instrument is a little too um, to um, soaring, and it, it's 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 not uh, pesant enough. I really am a lyric soprano, mm -hmm. and I am flattered by that. But I think I'd better leave those uh, to my distinguished colleagues who are more prepared. Well, let me <laughs> let me suggest at least then that on those sections that you like and that you think are adapted to your voice, make a record and win an 18th Grammy. Do some <laughs> Wagnerian selections. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. And uh, since um, umpteenth of those Grammys we've won together, uh, I would accept your advice again. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure with a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> that won't be difficult. It's just passing on a philosophy that has held me in good stead till this instant. Even in the beginning, sing on your vocal interest, not your vocal capital. That's an interesting point. But specifically of the talent itself, because oh. that is the kernel of what a career is made of. The attention that's given to it is very important. The uh, mental attitude about the instrument is imperative to begin with one that has great positive focus in the beginning. And I repeat myself, it is that going from a nuance to a forte gives you more uh, elasticity than starting on a forte and trying to come back to a nuance. It's I like see. life itself. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it, um, it, it is, it is keeping, not keeping something in reserve, but it, it is an outward attitude about, uh, um, about singing and knowing your own instrument. It has to do with the talent itself and how it is taken care of. Everything can happen around that, but that is a good way to have a good idea about whatever technique, even as young as that, that you are being exposed to by whatever teachers that you have faith in. Your own responsibility is to be sure that the talent is focused so that it will serve you well as long as possible. That sums it up in a nutshell. <laughs> I can say without a moment's hesitation, the night in January 1961, when I made my debut at the Metropolitan Opera House. It still remains a perfect moment in my life. There are instances now when I have flashbacks of that evening. It is a glorious moment, and it will always be, I think, the, the epitome of achievement for me in that it represented in, 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 in a sort of homespun way to say it, so that it's very simplistic. But wonderful things are always simplistic. They are terribly uncomplicated. I felt wonderful about life, about the world, about everything. I felt that I had climbed Mount Everest, and it was a success. And I was out in space, and all was right with the world. Um, there are other mountains that one may climb, but they never have the same substance as that one. Um, what that house did for me and with me that night is something I will n never, ever forget. It was, a, it was a moment of happiness that I bask in even now. Well, if I recall, you had 17 curtain calls, and the ovation went on and on and on. It was, a, it was a vibration of acceptance as, as, as a human being, which is, which is indelible. It's one of those kind yes. of things. And you, 
you just uh, never ever uh, get over. It was a glorious, glorious moment. I'll have it until you know all, all my life. And that was in Verdi's Il Trovatore <laughs> it too. It was in Trovatore. I, everything was perfect. Yes. Totally perfect. Because Franco Corelli made his debut that night. Yes, I had a beautiful leading man, a great conductor, distinguished colleagues. We don't have to argue about the acoustics of the old Metropolitan Opera House. <laughs> it was as if you were singing to the to the gods. It was it was everything I'd ever. I think if I wrote a book that night, it would have been called good heavens from Mississippi to the Met. I mean, it was... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it was glory. It was well, glory. And, you know, in all those years since, you never once let us down at the Met or anywhere else, for that matter. You just go from one triumph to another. And well, I think that ties in with probably what you said earlier exactly. about singing on your interest and not on your capital. Well, this house deserves your best. And you once said, I believe, too, that God gives each throat only so many notes, so spend them carefully. Yes, I'm a little stingy, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I hope it hasn't been taken too personally. But it is, but it is a joy to, at, it, at this stage to be able to, to, to continue to give, I think, my best. I don't really believe, I, I say to myself sometimes these days, that um, I am glad I, I, I kept this philosophy, which I really think is important to young artists. And, and when they talk to me now, and they do as a big sister until I'm involved with them more personally, I think it is very, very rewarding in that you sing on your vocal interests, not, not your capital. In other words, you can, you can always uh, go from a, for, from a pianissimo to a forte. Yeah. And, and you know, the world itself could, it, it, it would be very dull without nuances, I think. So that's the principle, I believe. Right. Well, that's an interesting question. I would not say protect the voice. That's a little, that, that sounds, make, it looks like a bird in a gilded cage syndrome. I would say that you, you simply uh, recognize what your priorities are. I'm an all work, all play artist. I can only do one thing. Um, I like to do one thing thoroughly well at a time. Um, giving a good performance to me and what it gives back to you is something that as, as artists, keeps us alive. It, what, it is what makes us live. Um, it, it makes us distinctive type of, of um, shall we say, uh, creative art addicts. I mean, we go from one wonderful fix from the audience to another. So I think that, that, you, that you really, if you're very non-compromising as I am and very serious, um, you do everything. Much fuller. Same extension, but uh, so one of my great dreams, but never have I pushed my voice to something, no matter how badly I wanted to do it, was to sing a role like Tosca, a role like Adriana, or roles like Norma. And suddenly here I was. They were great. They were easy for me. Anna, you have also an insatiable intellectual curiosity. And you apply all your knowledge in your profession as an opera singer so that with your talent some people might think that it was easy to become an amofo, the famous singer. But was it not also hard work? And did you got easily to the top or did you have to conquer the audience? Which is my belief that the audience has to be not only convinced and served, but conquered. Well, you see, I think uh, any performance any performer, it's a love affair with their audience. It either works or it doesn't work. And there's no way, there's no way. You have to seduce them, but, but legitimately, I mean. You have to deliver, you have to... Yes, I had very easy success. Mm -hmm. I, be, I became Anamoff overnight. What I would like to say, it was much more difficult all this time to remain Anamoff, because really it is very hard to conquer success but it's much more difficult when you do it at a very early age to sustain a level of, of, of performance plateau. yes we heard now anna Mofo in gilda and in traviata but i would like to ask you now a delicate question mm -hmm. concerning the role of thais mm -hmm. few singers can afford to appear as thais since the role demands a short a very short appearance 
nude or seemingly nude on the stage and you sang this role. Mm -hmm. Isn't it a daring act to appear seemingly or really nude before an audience even for a few seconds? Well, I didn't. <laughs> you did not appear uh, No, nude? but I don't think it's any more daring than Salome. It is not more daring? I wouldn't think so, no. You did tie it. Well, I mean, I did with the body stocking. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Yes, but yes. for the audience, it, it seemed that for that particular seduction scene, yes, you are for a second. but it's second. a very, very brief moment, whereas I Salome, am. for example, is much longer, or Popea, or there are many parts where... Also, I've noticed that directors are doing unusual things now. They, there was, I was recently in Germany. They managed to find a way to do a scene from Don Giovanni with undressing Zelina. I mean, this is I totally know. unnecessary, mm -hmm. I Yes, think. or they saw the Don Giovanni, I saw yeah. the Stuttgart, yeah. when the Don Giovanni had to hang himself in there. Yeah, well. Yeah. But these are the so-called... Yes, it's very difficult. These are the so-called, in my view, distortions, mm -hmm. and in their view, mm -hmm. they are inventions. Now, I don't believe that you, as a prima donna and as a name, have to accept all these kinds no, of No, you don't. But yes. I would like to say something I've learned, Lorenzo, that very few people think of. In order to do something really new, really new, you have to know everything that's old. Absolutely, you have to know from what you go away with. Exactly, and I maintain there's no one who knows everything that's old. Nobody. So and I mean that, that all the so-called innovations are very iffy. I'm sure if you go back in history you'll find somebody else thought of it or did it and it was a mistake then and it's still a mistake. Uh, except I know that, for example, there are certain stage directors now, like for example the ring was staged by Chéreau and he was very convinced that the fact that he never saw a ring before is a great advantage because he's very free. He's not. He's, he's not, not uh, going to imitate. Heavy. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I disagree. Anna, you are teaching now. Mm -hmm. Do you like to teach, and what is the reason that you started to teach? Now, you speak to someone, for example, who is considerably older than you, but I never taught. All right, I judge, I give some advice, but I never taught. Do you be really believe that singing can be taught, or as I think, can be only channeled? The available material can be channeled, but when there is no voice, you cannot produce a voice. Well, needless to say, I don't have a lot of time to teach, Lorenzo. I wish I did, because I was challenged by the fact, would I be able to, for, even for my own self, verbalize what I'm doing, because I think that's very important. The important thing for me about my teaching has been that I know a lot more about singing than I thought I did, and I was able to explain it. I think I know what good interpretation, good diction, good phrasing. Also, it's been my experience that famous singers were all kind of freaks, and they were unable to tell really what they were doing. And that's a, very, that's a very dangerous remark on my part, but I think it's true. All great singers have some sort of, they're not tricks, but they're things that they do that are totally natural. They're born with it, and they can't teach anybody else to do it. This is very interesting because especially those who have formidable vocal resources, they think that their way of singing can be applied to a pupil. And this is not always the case because it becomes too bato or they start to yell. As yeah, nice well, it can be applied to every student. You see, that's, that's what right. I didn't do. Yes. I made a tailor-made to each of my students a totally, the basic technique, the breathing yes. and so on was the same. You're absolutely right. You can't give someone a voice if they don't have it. But with correct breathing, and I made a big thing about this with my students, and I didn't have that many, I did get them all. This is not bragging. <laughs> I was thrilled. I did get them all to sing better. Anna, let us sing. hear one more record. What would you suggest? Well, I would like to play something in the heavier... All right, what is... Aida? All right. The Nile scene? All right, the Nile scene. All okay. right, let's hear it. Please. I consider myself a soprano. A soprano? Yes. Very well a said. Lyric, a lyric soprano. I don't think there's any thing like a spinto or color to it. You don't think so? No, I think that I am times. a soprano, yes. In, in the, the old, old times, times yes. People yeah. sang Lucia one night and uh, Norma I, the next and Carmen the next. And you are for that? I haven't gotten around to Carmen except on records. But yeah, I think yes. that would be the most healthy. Anna, is there anything else you want to say about your present career? Nothing except that I hope to well, continue to please my fans and... And to yourself. And myself, yes. All right. 
It was a very great pleasure, Anna. Thank you. My guest today was the famous American soprano Anna Moffo, who spoke for the first time English with me. Mm -hmm. And she said many things which I think interest an audience, and especially young singers, who have to embark on this, as Rudolf Bing said, the most difficult and most cruel of all professions to be an opera singer. The Arthur Godfrey show as a mezzo because Dichtoira Halla was not going to be uh, uh, understood by that particular kind of audience. And we wanted something that was going to really show uh, something that somebody knew. And so we chose, my teacher in California chose uh, Mon Coeur, and, uh, because it had become popular by a popular singer. And then I went to the Juilliard and I was mixing it up all the time. You were? I was mixing it up all the time. Uh, was my, it hard for them to, to uh, find a place for you then no, 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 no. you were mixing it up? No, it was not. It was uh, what I was trying to do was to go with my voice and what my voice said it could do. A couple of the things I shouldn't have done and so forth, but I love the role so much that I did them anyway. Uh, but basically I came to New York as a, mezz uh, as a soprano, but went to the Juilliard because she heard me sing a mezzo role and heard that particular color and I became sort of a mezzo, but I always had the high notes. Now let's talk about Macbeth. You're listening to Macbeth today. It must bring back memories for you. Your Great. Lady Macbeth at La Scala in 1975 was a triumph for you and for the audience. Oh, well, it was a great, it was for just everybody. I had such a ball. And uh, I never will forget it. It's one of the highlights in my life. But I understand I you were reluctant to take on the role in the first place. I was, because it's such a dark opera. It truly is. I had read the play at Juilliard. I have all of the Shakespeare plays at home. And I just never thought about it until uh, Claudio Abado began to talk to me about it. And it took me actually a little bit more than two years for him to convince me. And I finally went out and bought the score. He said, go out and buy, buy the score one day, one night at dinner at our home. He said, go and get the score or I'll send you one. <laughs> so that you can take a look at it, because I used to like, everybody, I think every singer looks at the score, no matter if you're a soprano, mezzo, or whatever, because every mezzo role is not for, every, for you to sing, right. like every soprano role. So I'd look at it and i said, this is something. I loved it very, very much. And I said, little work here, work there, work there, work there, but it's really doable. And, and yes. you said that, uh, as I read in your autobiography, you said you prepared so extensively that you felt ready to go on? I did. I really did. Uh, once I decided I was going to do this, I did take it to Sarah Caldwell because we had become friends and I wanted her to hear it because I always like to go into a production with an idea musically, stage-wise, stagecraft and everything within my own system and whatever the uh, uh, director would like I love that. Even going from one production to the other, I hate doing the same thing over and over again. So no, I did go into it very extensively and found out where inside of me, because we all are so many different people, that we don't, we have to pull out, we have to pull on them. And so I could pull this uh, Lady Macbeth character out. Uh, now, four weeks from today, the Met a radio audience will hear you sing in one of our historic broadcasts, 1975, Rossini's The Siege of Corinth, with you and Beverly Sills. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, that was great fun. I remember that was a time also that Beverly made her debut, and I was on stage with her. We had already become friends, and uh, playing a male's part. <laughs> I think I had done it, or done something before, or feel maybe, but otherwise I didn't do the uh, the pants part. You didn't do the Neocle before that? I, I had not done it before. Mm -hmm. I had been asked to do it at La Scala and it's kind of fun because in my book I say something about when they had asked me to do it at La Scala uh, when they did it when Marilyn Horn did it who is also a friend wonderful wonderful great singer she did it I, I, I said no and she did it then when we came back to the United States they asked her because I had already turned it down that other time. I oh. made the recording and she said I was a fool. I said I was a fool the first time. She said she was a fool the second time. <laughs> no, really a great, uh, it was great fun uh, trying uh, myself as uh, a masculine kind of uh, figure on the stage. It was really, really very great. Will you talk about your acting? I mean, you've 
said that you are influenced by so many other sorts of stage performers, actors, dancers. In, yes. What did they bring to your portrayal? Portrayals? Well, of course, the acting, that, that's really, after singing, acting is my, my thing. The drama is very important to me. I always feel that everybody's expecting us to sing well. But how do we move on the stage? That's where the dancing comes in. And so I used to go to many performances of, uh, of uh, the ballet. I wanted to see how they move. I have books on the ballet and, and things like that. Just looking at that, taking some classes also to be able to do certain things that I wanted to do, how I wanted to present myself in a particular role. And I think it all began with my family, my father and mother. They were, it was, I came from a musical family and uh, that was very important. The word, the word, the word. What are you talking about? What are you trying to communicate? What are you trying to communicate? I don't care how beautiful the voice is. I want both. And so it came from childhood, and I just can continue that with, you know, with wonderful teachers and so forth, like Boris Goldowski, my first year in New York City at the Juilliard. I went to uh, Tanglewood, and it was really great to begin to understand and understand the techniques of how to do certain kinds of things, and that was great for me. Well, we'll be looking forward to hearing that performance uh, from the Siege of Corinth in just a few weeks. Uh, Shirley Barrett, it's been so good to have you here joining us in the radio studio. It's good to be here, I can tell you. That was Shirley Barrett joining us in the broadcast booth. First, how did you wind up singing the Canadian and American national anthems at the All-Star Game in Montreal last July? That's what I want to know. Well, I would presume that Canadian and the American felt that it was the best, that's why. <laughs> I can't tell you how flabbergasted I was when I started to watch the game, and the last person I thought I was going to see at the All-Star game was Louis Quillico, and there he was in I, front of 26 million people. I have to say one thing. It was a very nervous-wracking thing to do because it, you know what, what the little ant would feel on the floor walking? That's exactly the way I felt because to walk in that big, huge stage of 56,000 people, it's really the first time I do a thing like this. And I have to say, another thing that got me a little bit scared, a year before, my son had to sing the national anthem for the football game in Toronto. Mm -hmm. But what happened? The week before that football game, there's a popular singer that did these two national anthem, and he made a mistake in the word. And the whole stadium got up and booed him out of the stage. Now my son, he says, Dad, I have to sing this national anthem. And he got very panicky about it. And all of a sudden, that's what I was going through to. I says, no, not only 56,000 people, but uh, 100 million people was going to listen to the baseball game, you know. Bianca, let's talk to you for just a minute. What roles are you doing at the Met this year? I did Gioconda and Un Ballo in Maschera. And what are your favorite roles of all the roles that you've done? I don't have favorite roles. I love all the roles. I put my spirit, my... I drop into the score and I go. <laughs> she, she reminds me of an old maestro that I knew very well. His favorite opera was always the one he was conducting. <laughs> <laughs> so yours is whatever one you're singing, right? Yes. Yeah. Louis, the last time we talked last year, I think you told me you did... Rigoletto over 500 times on stage. Not exactly 500 times, it's less than that. It's about 400 times. Like, my, like my Trovatore, if you permit. Uh -huh. I have 480 something. <laughs> Does Rigoletto change for you anymore, or is it the same role? Oh no, it always changes. It's the subtleties. There's so many subtleties, uh, and the mind is never in the same frame of mind and the first thing you know these are the things that are created by themselves and this is why Rigoletto well I think any role is the same except I would say maybe Trovatore Trovatore is a very such a straightforward role that the man is so frustrated he's looking for this girl he Evistignani and Marilyn Horn I have some other favorite singer soprano mezzo soprano in, in the state we have beautiful voices oh really you do a lot of work in europe when are you going back to europe again when i finished my contract with the metropolitan i had to go monte carlo germany what are you going to be doing there aida don carlos ah 
Trovatore. Again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> ah, eh, come si dice? Obsessed. Ossessionata. You said it. Obsessed. Ossessionata del Trovatore. Hai che si flame. Il figlio mio. Just, just be careful with an Italian, the way he will say that word, huh? It's true. Cosa? It's true. Flame. Way... No, 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 no. I said obsess. flame. Obsess. Obsess. Ah, when I, when I study, I said obsessed. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> obsessed. obsessed. <laughs> I don't know what this means. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we, what are you forgiving me, please? We understand. But well, if you know <laughs> Bianca, you know that these words are very, they're very usual uh -huh. for her. Okay. <laughs> oh, you are so... <laughs> Louis, we've talked about your stage roles and the fact that you did Rigoletto so often, but what about on recordings? What recording of yourself that you have done? Well, Do most, of the, most of the recording I've done, they're specialties. Another thing that I have to say, I think I'm one of the most treasured pirate recording artists there is, because I think, if I remember well, uh, pirate recording of Rigoletto alone I know there's a list about between 24 to about 30 of them. All different performance, not one performance, different performance. The only real, I would say, maybe classic, uh, popular one that it, there is, is the one with uh, Beverly Sills of uh, Ipuritani. And I think it's a very beautiful recording. Louis Quilligo and Bianca Berini, tonight's special guests on WNCN Live. And part two of this duo recital is coming up in just a moment. Louis Bianca, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Usually in the shower, and if I don't sing through with Meatloaf or whatever these songs, then I feel really, oh dear, something's going to go wrong. <laughs> Silly little things. Mm. <laughs> well, we've talked singing, we've talked vocal range, we've talked roles, we've talked um, superstition. Now let's get down to the really important stuff. Uh, Ms. Eaglin, I understand you are a big wrestling fan. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, I'm afraid I am. <laughs> now, when did that begin? Oh, I guess maybe two or three years ago, actually. Probably three years ago. Um, my brother, who's always been a big sports fan, had discovered on English television the World Wrestling Federation from America and said, you have to watch this, you're going to love this. I'm like, no. WWF. That's it. <laughs> so about six months later, I was staying with him and he just basically made me watch this and I, that was it I was hooked after about five minutes just thought it was wonderful kind of like opera actually it, it's exaggerated um, what they do the the characters they're at their actors actually and they're incredibly talented athletes that take their um, talents and kind of hone them to a really high level and then just build on that I think and I think it's it's very operatic and I love it well Jane Eaglin uh, thank you so much for your time and um, gosh uh, break a leg tonight thank you very much thank you in Leo Janacek's opera The Macropolis Case what they witnessed instead was the on-stage death of another performer commentator Harlow Robinson was there when Richard Versal stopped singing and fell 15 feet backwards from a ladder, landing with a sickening thud on the Metropolitan Opera stage. Many of us thought that it was all just part of the show. After all, this was the opening performance of the Met's premiere production of an offbeat modern opera. In these days, when the director reigns on the operatic stage, you never know what to expect. But Versal just stayed on his back, absolutely still without a single muscular reflex. Our confusion turned to horror. Conductor David Robertson, a young American making a Met debut that was turning out to be more remarkable than he ever wished, stopped the orchestra. He called out in a stunned voice, plainly audible to the audience, Richard, are you all right? There was no answer. Richard, are you all right? He repeated, still no answer. Suddenly the curtain came down. Robertson bravely announced a 20-minute pause, and we all knew that Richard Versal's fall was definitely not part of the show. Real life in the unexpected form of death had intruded into this holy shrine of art. But art gave Versal's shocking death a bizarre and wondrous resonance. In the small role of Vitek, a lawyer's clerk, Versal sang the first words of the Macropolis case. One of his very first notes is a high B, 
not easy to sink under any circumstances, let alone clinging to a vertical ladder 15 feet above the stage. Vitek sets up the appearance of Elena Macropolis, a man-killing opera star who's been alive for 337 years thanks to an elixir invented by her father. But her time is running out. She's come to get the formula for another dose. Vitek's boss can help Elena Macropolis. He's handling a court case over the property of one of her early 19th century lovers. Somewhere in the lover's papers is the magic formula that'll give her another 300 years. The last words Richard Versailles Vitek sang were these, you can only live so long. Vitek was referring to the original parties to the lawsuit, but Janacek also intended them to foreshadow the decision Elena Macropolis will make at the opera's end. She realizes that to live forever is to be forever unhappy and chooses to die rather than renew her life. None of the other characters wants the elixir either. They've seen its evil consequences in the life of Elena Macropolis. At the opera's end, Vitek's daughter burns the formula so that it can never be used again. The opera's message is clear. We humans must accept our mortality. Death is a part of life. Life has value only because of death. Both Janacek and Karel Chapek, author of the play on which the opera is based, rejected the idea of artificially prolonging life by scientific means, a concept very popular in the 1920s when the play and opera were written. So when Richard Versailles sang, you can only live so long, and then died, there was something strangely beautiful about the scene. This dedicated 63-year-old musician could not have hoped for a more dramatic and ennobling end. His death provided the starkest illustration I have ever witnessed of the close and inevitable intertwining of art and life. It makes us ask the question, does art imitate life or does life imitate art? At a time when so many voices in America question the value of the arts, this incident at the Met also gives me cause for hope. It affirms that what we call classical music is not merely a source of entertainment. It's not just a way to escape the world outside the concert hall and pass a pleasant evening with friends. Great music like Janacek's illuminates and helps to unravel the great mysteries of life. Birth, joy, grief, love, and yes, death. We shouldn't fear music's dark side, recalling that the most profound creations often emerge from the most bitter misfortunes. For me, this is one of the lessons of Richard Vassal's disturbing death. Art isn't always safe. Harlow Robinson is professor of German and Slavic languages at the State University of New York in Albany. Tragedy, like history, tends to repeat itself. Thirty-five years ago, baritone Leonard Warren died on stage at the Met in a performance of Verdi's opera La Forza del Destino. I would at least like to say one thing to Norm, that the grant that I received in 1974 meant so much to me and to the development of my career and for the people that I studied with. And in order to allow me to continue to study, you have really no idea. And it is an incredible pleasure today for me and a, and a young artist to be able to, to perform and to give back a little, just a little bit of what I received many years ago. Thank you all very, very much. New York opera fans know the work of Francisco Casanova through his performances at the Metropolitan Opera with the Opera Orchestra of New York. And he recently made his La Scala debut in, uh, in Italy, in the center of the, uh, of the Italian opera universe, uh, doing uh, Verdi's I Due Foscari with Maestro Muti. Welcome to Soundcheck, Francisco Casanova. Thank you, Mr. Preston. First, I want to ask you, what was the experience of singing Verdi? with Riccardo Muti at La Scala, the shrine of Italian opera-like. What was this experience? What were your feelings leading up to it? Well, what I had been working all my life for was finally there. Yeah. 
the Milanese feel like they own Verdi. Let's not forget that Verdi made his debut in La Scala. Verdi also had his first fiasco in La Scala mm -hmm. and then his final consecration with Nabucco. Muti, an artist of an incredible discipline, not only in what concerns discipline as we usually understand it, the, rig the rigore, but also as craftsmanship, mm -hmm. like every great conductor such as Levine would be. A very demanding man of himself as well as of the people that work with him. Mm -hmm. um, at this point in my life, I knew I was prepared to do what I had to do. Mm -hmm. I went there on the 25th of April with a great piece of advice that was given to me by Maestro Levine. From the Met, the, from uh, the Met. artistic director of the after, Metropolitan Opera. Yeah, after a performance of Nabucco. He knew that I was going there and uh, I had asked him advice. He came to my dressing room after a performance and he told me basically what to do. And what did he tell you to do? It's a secret. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a trade secret, huh? It's a trade secret. Ancient opera secret, huh? <laughs> and I heeded his advice like I did last year for Le Vepre Sicilien. Uh -huh. Because last year when I was to sing Le Vepre Sicilien in Amsterdam, I asked him the night of the 8th of May as he came to my dressing room to give me encouragement to go and sing for Pavarotti. I just asked him, I said, look, I'm okay. Now I need to ask you a question. What about Le Vepre Sicilien? I followed his advice. This is the Sicilian Vespers, yeah. another Verdi opera with a very difficult tenor part. And I followed to the letter his advice. And uh, I'm grateful that there is a Jimmy Levine. Very grateful. Well, so, it all worked out for yeah. your debut at La Scala. It all you did. had, you know, it's hard to, to garner cultural, uh, uh, critical praise for your performances there, and popular acclaim, and also have everyone working there like you all at once. It's a particularly, it's known as a thorny place to work. It is, but uh, as I said, I felt ready mm -hmm. for this. I was ready, and uh, I was willing to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever I have worked with somebody of the stature of Muti or Levine, all they want for you is to be willing to work. Mm -hmm. That has been, this is my opinion based on my experience with, of my work with people of that stature. Mm -hmm. Daniel Oren, Maestro Rudel, you know, all these people. All they want is you to be willing to work mm -hmm. so that things can happen, whatever it is that has to happen. Now, uh, I had just come from the Met from singing with Maestro Levine, uh, Nabucco. And I went to sing with Maestro Muti. And what how is, is that experience different? These are two great opera conductors. They obtain the same quality, each one with his own personality, of course, mm -hmm. because it's undeniable. When we work in, uh, in, in the interpretative field, it is expected of you to put whatever it is that you have brought to this world when you were born, mm -hmm. because we bring something and then we develop it. Besides that, they both achieve the same kind of quality, but in my opinion, approaching it from apparently different points of view. What's Levine's whereas, approach? Whereas Maestro Levine would give you, in the first rehearsal, a broad line, which he later is going to tighten up to make it breathe mm -hmm. and, and make it pulse. Mm -hmm. You know, Maestro Muti 
will work on the details first in order to build the edifice. I see. Let's hear, let's hear some results of, of your work with Maestro Muti. We'll hear the aria Dal più remoto esilio uh, from I due Foscari. And this is taken from one of your performances, one of yes. your recent performances it at was, La Scala. It was the debut. That's my guest today on Soundcheck, Francisco Casanova singing Dal Più Remoto Esilio in performance at La Scala with the orchestra conducted by Maestro Ricardo Muti. We'll go back to that performance in just a, a couple of minutes, but first, Francisco, let's go even further back. How did you get into singing to begin with? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that far back, huh? That far back, before this life. <laughs> my family, my father was a tenor, he played the violin and the clarinet, my mother was a pianist. I'm the youngest of four children. And you grew up in the Dominican Republic? In the Republic. Dominican Republic, in Santa Cruz del Seibo, let's not forget that. One of the oldest, perhaps the oldest town founded by Europeans in this continent that is still standing. It turns 500 years Good this, this, this year. Uh, besides the capital of Santo Domingo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In any case, uh, music was uh, el padre nuestro de cada día, the, our daily bread in my house. Every night after dinner, my mother would get at the piano and start playing. My father would pull out his violin and all these sonatas and things would happen and even popular songs. Before you knew, we had 50 people standing at the door listening. Because, you know, small town, you open the door because it's hot. And you would sing along? And, uh, you know, I grew up with that. And uh, my brother and sisters uh, would sing. Eventually, I started singing too. Uh, I remember the first voice I ever heard that really moved me was my father's. Mm -hmm. uh, in the house, he would go to his photographic studio. And as he would work, you know, he would start singing, whatever. And... Uh, I will never, ever forget that voice. Hmm. Never. But he was not a professional singer, was no, he? No, 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 no. He sang. Yes. But he was a singer, which is a difference. Have you realized a dream of his in a certain sense? This was my own dream. Yeah. This was my own dream. Uh, I always knew that I had to sing. Mm -hmm. There was nothing else in my mind. It was not until... 
age 19 that he told me something that made me wonder about whether we come to this plan plane knowing something or not. I definitely do believe in reincarnation. Mm. So uh, it made me wonder, but definitely I'm not realizing his dream. I'm realizing my responsibility to my gift, mm -hmm. which other people would call destiny. I see. Now, you sing popular repertoire as well from time I to love, time? Yes, I love to sing popular songs mm -hmm. like everybody always did. Because let's not forget that once, not too long ago, because a hundred years is nothing. It's really nothing when you realize that the history as we know it is about 7,000 years old. Mm -hmm. The historic time in which we live. Uh, popular singers had to have at least a technical procedure just as we do on the stage, on the classical stage. There were no microphones. There were exactly. So they had to have this kind of technical procedure, similar. Perhaps the voices were, let's say, less important, mm -hmm. less, uh, less operatic. Mm -hmm. in, in whatever that may mean, it doesn't mean anything to me really, but I like to say it that way. Uh, for convenience sake. Yes. <laughs> uh, but they did have to project their voices in the space in which they were singing. The microphone uh, is, uh, is something that happened uh, when, 80 years ago? That's nothing. Yeah. It's the lifetime of one person, you know, oh, if they get to leave 80. Uh, so those songs that are written for voices, mm -hmm. I like to sing them. Now let's get back to your recent experience uh, singing in Idue Foscari at La Scala. Mm -hmm. uh, Ricardo Muti, the conductor, is known for being kind of restrictive with his singers. There are a lot of traditional high notes that opera singers take in almost every performance, and, and audiences have come to expect most of these as though they were written in the score by the composer. Mm -hmm. But when you're singing with Maestro Muti, you don't sing those notes, right? Depends. Depends. I see. I followed so well Maestro Levine's advice that at, at one rehearsal he said to me, Casanova, please be a tenor and hold that high note. <laughs> 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 no, look, I think that every young singer should sing, should train, knowing the tradition but she learns thing, should learn things first as written. Mm -hmm. Very strictly. W yeah. Why? It makes you go to the kernel of real music making. It's like when you listen to Pollini, Pollini Maurizio Pollini, Maurizio Pollini the, the, pianist. the pianist, when you listen to him, he goes directly to the kernel that makes music not to the effects. So as a singer, you're thinking of what went into that role and that piece, not thinking about that big high note coming up. Thank you very much. Exactly. Why don't we hear uh, another look, look, excerpt? Look, for example, yeah? the usual way that one would sing that aria that we just heard. Dale più remoto esilio which is following the natural stress of the measure, which is six eighths. Mm -hmm. But that's not what Verdi wrote. Verdi wrote, Dal più remo tu esi, accentuating this, the weak beat, which is the third beat. Aha. Uh -huh. Why? Because he's crying. Aha. Uh -huh. And that is how in the classical period, instead of, instead of sobbing, it was done more stylistically through done, the music. Exactly. Um. But of course you have to follow. Verdi is classic. He's a romantic classic. He's not verismo. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to the cabaletta from the aria we just heard uh, from Idue Foscari. Here is my guest today, Francisco Casanova. <laughs> Pietoso il genitore, speravo i 
Live at La Scala, audio solo ed audio atroce from i due foscari by Verdi, my guest today on Soundcheck singing, Francisco Casanova with Ricardo Muti and the orchestra at La Scala. Francisco, congratulations on the success at La Scala, for Thank one you, thing. Thank you, Mr. Presto. And uh, you have a couple of things coming up uh, here in the area on August 30th at 8 p.m. at Cooper River Park in Pensacola, New Jersey. You'll be singing uh, Edgardo in Lucia di la Marmor with the Metropolitan Opera. Yes, yes. I didn't know it was in Cooper River Park. I did there at Tosca two years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, with the Met. Yeah, uh, Lucia, and then the 26th of September, I believe it's going to be in Alice Tolly Hall. The first Dominican week in New York, I'll be singing with the Symphony Orchestra of the Dominican Republic, some Dominican songs and mm -hmm. things. I don't know yet the program they uh, are putting it together. That's going to be the 26th of September. But keep that in mind. Why don't we play out, because we're running out of time. Time is so fleeting. Uh, with one of your favorite tenors whom you have chosen. This is Benjamino Gigli, one of the great singers, one of the great voices of all time. And let me just thank you, Francisca Casanova, for joining us on Soundcheck today on WNYC. Thank you, George. Our pleasure. I noticed my voice and told me that, you know, there's, you have a future in this. You should look at it. But me being the young kid I was, growing up in the South, uh, wanting to be the jock, I, I ended up fo focusing most of my efforts on, on athletics. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't until, you know, very recently, well, not very recently, that... I sang at a lot of my college teammates' weddings and, and things like that where people really started prodding me, saying, hey, you should do this. You should look at this as a profession. So I figured then that, you know, everyone can't be just filling my head up with air. So I, <laughs> I must, you know, there must be something there. And I would listen to broadcasts. I'd listen to recordings and hear people do things and say, hey, I can make that sound too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that kind of encouraged me to give it a shot. So, <laughs> But you had very different <clears throat> plans. I was a sales rep in the Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. I covered all of D.C., I covered Virginia, I called on their government accounts, and I sold data storage. Um, 
I was a regular guy. I had a company car, expense account, you know, did a lot of travel. So I yeah. was just a regular working guy. And, and during that process, abandoned music altogether. I actually sang at a lot of my teammates' weddings, a lot mm-hmm. of my friends' weddings. I did the national anthem at the uh, CFL football game up in uh, Baltimore at the time, down in Baltimore from here. Um, you know, I kind of kept that that open, but it was always a question in my mind, you know, I know I can do this now. I know that I have a, a special talent. I know that God has given me this voice, but I'm only using it to make sales presentations. So there had to be some, something more, some other end for the gift. Well, yeah, I, I figured as much, but I didn't know what avenue to take. I mean, I, you know, I know I didn't sound like Will Downing, who's uh, one of my favorite R&B and pop and jazz singers. Uh-huh. So that wasn't an avenue I wanted to pursue. Um, and, you know, having the upbringing that I had, you don't, it's not normal to step out and venture into something unknown. I mean, I had a stable job. I had a great career going. Maybe you were trying to start, you had a wife. Yeah. And uh, were planning a family we're at st- least. Yeah. Pla- start, starting, we were in the, in the embryonic stages, if you will, of, of, of planning a family. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I think in, in actuality, she was the catalyst at the time that really, really, pushed and made it a comfortable decision for me. And what did she say? Well, when I was in Washington, D.C., you know, she knew I would, how I would always come home questioning, you know, why did I have this voice? What can I do with this? So she set up an audition with uh, the Choral Arts Society in Washington, D.C., without me knowing, and I came home on a Friday afternoon from work, and she says, by the way, you got an audition tomorrow, so I hope you're ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that was the the real awakening, because I sang from, for Norman Scribner down there. I did... Uh, the tuba midum from Mozart's Requiem. Mm-hmm. And he stopped playing and said, and this has got to, you know, what are you doing with yourself? And I said, well, I, you know, I, I want to sing. I just don't know what to do. He says, all right, I'll tell you what. You're going to be in my chorus, and I'm going to introduce you to people and get you going. Well, as soon as that happened, I ended up leaving 3M Company. We had a spinoff, and I ended up going to another company in the New England area. Mm-hmm. So that kind of stopped that process there. But once I got to New England, uh, she encouraged me, Denise encouraged me to go to the New England Conservatory, which had a weekend program for working professionals who wanted to study music also. So I did that w- program, and that's where Sharon Daniels heard me okay. from Boston University. Yeah. And then it just kind of hit the fan and took off from there. So Now, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, we both at different times did the same opera program at Boston University, the Opera Institute. and So we know some of the same people, including Sharon Daniels, sure. who, uh, who runs that program and is a terrific lady and teacher and, and director. What did Sharon hear you sing? I was doing a production in Salem, Massachusetts called Satan Ella, and uh, I was singing the role of, uh, of the devil, mm-hmm. as all basses do. And... <laughs> Uh, she walked up to me after the performance and she says, uh, you know, you really should think about doing this for a living. And I, at that point, I think I'd heard it one too many times. Yeah. So she told me to go prepare five arias, get you a teacher, and come and audition for us in May. This is like, I don't know, late October, early November of, of 1998. I auditioned for her program. I had to go out and hire a private teacher. Had to learn, you know, languages and pronunciation on the fly, basically. Right, sure. And, I mean, you're doing a job all this time, too. Oh, yeah, I was working. I had, you know, I had six states. I covered, I was a sales manager for New England for this plastics company, so I was pretty busy. But I I knocked that out and went and sang the audition for her. And, uh, you know, they recognized the natural voice, but I didn't have all the academic credentials and mm-hmm. all, the, all the study of conservatory behind me. So there was a bit of a question, and then she kind of gave me a test drive. She let me do a couple of coachings to see how I acted on my feet and had, gave me a, a real voice lesson and mm-hmm. decided that it was worth the risk. So she offered me a full scholarship and said, come on, jo- come on and join us at Opera That's Institute. Great. So, yeah. You know, it may come as a surprise. I'm going to ask you to back away from the microphone okay. just a little bit because you have one heck of a strong voice. Um, well, one comment I would have is that you may not have had all the schooling at that point in languages and repertoire and style and all that stuff, but there's no amount of schooling that can put a voice like that <laughs> in your throat. So you had one really big thing going for you. Well, I don't obviously. take any credit for that. God gave me that voice, mm-hmm. you know, my mom and dad and genetics. But um, you're right. I mean, all the things that I had to overcome were academic. And, you know, if you apply yourself and work hard enough, I'm a bright enough guy to figure out things. It took a lot of work. I mean, it seems like an insurmountable task if you look at it, but... Uh, it took quite a bit of work to get, you know, to a respectable level. I mean, I'm still not perfect, obviously. We all strive for that in this business. But it took a lot of work to get there. But I knew that I could do that part. You mm-hmm. know, God had taken care of the other part. And there's still refinements that you have to do vocally as well. Sure. I'm learning a lot about my voice that I didn't know because I had no clue. So, yes. 
Let's well, let's, let's uh, in just a few minutes, let's talk a little bit more about uh, some of that work. But uh, why don't we hear the voice, the singing voice? We've been listening to the speaking <laughs> voice. So take those headphones off and, All right. and, and, and let's hear, uh, hear a selection from my guest today on Soundcheck, <laughs> Morris Robinson. He's accompanied by pianist Myra Huang. And the first piece that we'll hear is by Giuseppe Verdi. It's from his opera Simon Boccanegra. It's the character Fiesco singing. The aria is Il Lacerato Spirito. Here is my guest today, bass Morris Robinson on 93.9 and WNYC.org. Thank you. 
Bravo. Morris Robinson, bass, on WNYC's sound check. Pianist Myra Huang, singing Il Lacerato Spirito from Simon Boccanegra by Giuseppe Verdi, the character, and singing that aria is Fiesco. I meant to ask you this before you sang. What is actually going on in that aria? What's, what's Fiesco singing about there? Well, uh, his daughter has, was raped and killed yeah. uh, by Simon Boccanegra. Uh, he is looking at the palace where she used to live, and he's reminiscing and kind of sad because this, this place reminds him of, of his daughter. Then he prays to the Virgin Mary. Then he curses the Virgin Mary. And at the end of the, of the aria there, he's actually asking for her forgiveness mm-hmm. and asking for, for uh, the forgiveness for his blasphemy. So, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, singing an, an aria like that and singing any operatic role is a lot different from getting up and singing something at a friend's wedding. There's a whole dramatic element that's involved with, with doing an opera. Uh, have you enjoyed getting into that world of the theater? You know, when I started out, uh, it was actually rather difficult because you're so inundated with things that you don't know yeah. and things that you do wrong that you become subconscious and self-conscious about the things that you aren't doing correct. So you kind of focus on the technical aspects, the pronunciation, the, the breathing, the production of the sound, more so than you do the characterization of what you're doing. Now that I have a few years under my belt and I'm a little bit more comfortable with the technical aspects of what I'm doing, mm-hmm. I'm able to take it another step and actually involve myself in the character, involve myself in the words, involve myself in the message I'm trying to portray, uh, which I think helps bring it all together. It makes it so much easier when you don't think about the technical things. They become second nature. So you can then concentrate on the character, which, Mm -hmm. you know, even if you do something technically not perfect, if you're relaying the message, if it's coming across that you're confident in what you're doing and what you're talking about, it brings it all together. So I'm getting to that point now. (laughs) Well, obviously. (laughs) Well, who knows? (laughs) What what were your first operatic experiences like? What was your f- the first role that you ever sang? Well, I tell people all the time, the first time I ever saw an opera, the first opera I ever went to, I was on stage singing The King and Aida at Boston <laughs> Lyric. So, uh, my first experience was that, with that was uh, actually very intimidating. I had to do my first music rehearsal in front of a conductor in Boston named Stephen Lord, yep. who gave me my, you know, obviously my first shot, if you will, on stage. And... Uh, Talk about someone whose who's Italian is perfect and someone mm-hmm. who had never done it before. In the first music rehearsal, he just kind of really got after me. But, you know, by me having a background from the Citadel and having a football background, you know, I can take punches. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, I realized, though, that, you know, coaches are just that, just as they are on the football field. They're getting on you because they want you to to achieve something. Right. And he, he kind of took that approach and took me under his wing. It was intimidating, but I got through it. And I, hopefully, well, obviously, in, in good enough fashion where he offered me f- three worlds the following year, so mm-hmm. it worked out, yeah. So he's doing that because he he could hear the potential, he could see the potential, right, right. and wanted to help right. you realize it. Of course. I mean, it's 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 an arduous task to try to go from ground zero, if you will, to uh, singing another language, you know, and singing a certain type of way. All that was foreign. So it was, it was very challenging, but, you know, we got through it, so... <laughs> Well, we will continue our conversation with bass Morris Robinson in just a moment here on Soundcheck and hear him sing some more. It's a terrific story. Uh, I'm George Preston, sitting in for John Schaefer. I'm George Preston on Soundcheck at 93.9 and WNYC.org. We have live in our studios bass Morris Robinson and pianist Myra Huang. We're not listening to Morris right now, but one of his favorite bass singers, Renee Papa, who is singing, uh, what we're listening to is an excerpt from The Creation by Haydn. And Morris, you've been fortunate enough to get some coachings from Rene Papa, who's really a phenomenal singer. He's not that much older than you, but he's been <laughs> steeped in particularly the German operatic tradition for a long time. Uh, currently, you're in, in the Met Young Artist program. Right, right. So let's talk uh, in general about some of the training and the help you're getting there and and maybe specifically about some of the legendary bases mm-hmm. that you've been able to uh, to work with one on one in general uh the met young artist program has been a godsend for me i mean coming from you know two years of training at the opera institute which is kind of a a, a microcosm of what the met young artist program yeah. is like uh it was really the best and the greatest next step for me uh, all the best resources in the world, all the best teachers in the world, the best coaches in the world, 
uh, the best facilities in the world, you know, are at my disposal. And because of that, I think that I've grown exponentially in, in the last two years that I've been there. And uh, in addition to working with world-class coaches and world-class conductors and world-class teachers, I'm also uh, given the opportunity to work with world-class singers. Uh, the gentleman you just heard, Renee Papa, is, you know, pretty phenomenal. He's, yeah. uh, but in fact, I walked up to him in the Met Cafeteria one day and said, hey, man, I'm about to do the uh, Wolf Michelangelo leader, you know, can you hook me up? <laughs> and he says, uh, what do you mean hook you up? You know, that type of thing. And I says, well, you know, I, come coach me. I want to get, you know, I want to make sure this is, is good for me. And he says, yes, my German is probably better than yours. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> but he, he's really cool. And uh, we were actually, I, he walked in unexpectedly when I was singing Russian. And uh, immediately we stopped and started working on the German. Yeah. I've also had the opportunity to work with Kurt Moll, which was, you know, which was one of the best experiences I've ever yeah, had. Kurt Moll is, is a veteran bass oh, and yeah. one of the best balanced artists out there. He can sing just about anything. Yeah. A great actor, a great song interpreter, and a fantastic voice. He's great. I mean, he's just a great person. And uh, while he was here doing uh, abduction, he worked with me three times a week for two weeks in a row. And I just, I got up early. I was there bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I was ready to go because, you know, anything that you can get from a legendary person like that is 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 invaluable. Mm -hmm. uh, in like what are some of the specific things th that you learned working with Court Mull? Uh, well, you know, they, they have these base secrets, if you will. I mean, you know, how to attack... <laughs> <laughs> are there any other bases out there listening? I don't want them to hear this. Uh, it's privy information. <laughs> no, they... Especially with Kurt. I mean, he stylistically, the way he approaches certain notes on where you should cover, what you shouldn't cover, what sounds best, how you should save your voice for this part so you can sing this part. I mean, just, you know, the inside scoop on what it is that I'm doing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what I got most valuable from him was because I'm young and I don't know which direction to go as far as repertoire goes. And, you know, once he heard my voice, I asked him, I said, hey, what do you think I should be looking at? What do you think I should be working on? He says very eloquently, you should sing everything I say. So, uh, That's, <laughs> that leaves a broad repertoire It for certainly you. does. It didn't you really know? narrow it down because he's done everything. I mean, but uh, I was fortunate enough to see him do uh, his Ozmi's uh, this past season at the Met, and I think I only missed two. He was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, so, just yeah. watching him perform would be a, a lesson in itself. It, every time, yeah, every time you get to see him. When we were talking before the show started, you mentioned that uh, bass Samuel Ramey is one of your favorite singers. Yeah. We have Sam Ramey queued up, ready to go with something, and uh, and then once we hear it, we'll talk about why you admire and like his singing so okay. much. Here is Sam Ramey singing La Calunia from Rossini's Barber of Seville. And I'm very much enjoying the performance <laughs> of bass Sam Ramey singing uh, La Calunia from the Barber of Seville by uh, Joaquino Rossini. My guest today in the studio is bass singer Morris Robinson. <laughs> Who's doing his best Milli Vanilli impersonation That's right, right now. now <laughs> as, or as we mentioned, Milli Vanilli of Seville. And <laughs> Morris, can you tell us why you so much admire the, uh, the work of, of uh, Sam Raimi? Well, first of all, I can't believe you have me singing on the same program with that recording. <laughs> uh, you stack up pretty well. <laughs> Technically perfect, terrific musicianship, yeah. great sound, uh, no mistakes. I mean, I heard the guy sing every performance of Nabucco this past season, mm -hmm. and it was almost like listening to a recording. I mean, you can sit there. It's like taking a class. I mean, he, he, he doesn't make mistakes. And I think that, you know, just like in athletics, just like in everything else you do in life, consistency really means a lot. And uh, if you're on the football field, and you may not be the fastest guy in the world, Emmett Smith wasn't the fastest running back in the world, but he was very consistent. He had a high average yard, yards per carry. And mm -hmm. he was, because of his consistency, he broke a record. You know, Sam, I think, is the same way in that he's very consistent. He doesn't make mistakes. He's very technically sound. His languages are perfect. And you can depend on him every single night to be right there doing exactly what he's supposed to do at a very, very high professional level. Yeah. And that, to me, is just... You know that's what it's all about. I mean, we all strive to be perfect, and if there's anyone that's close to it, I would, I would say he's it. So. And the word is, he's one of the <laughs> the most delightful ideal colleagues to work with. He's in really. The I haven't spent that time with him on stage, but I sat out in the house and watched all the rehearsals. And here's a gentleman that's probably done the role uh, that he did in Nabucco. You know, ten, twelve, fifteen times, mm -hmm. probably even more than that. 
And he was attentive. He was a, paid a lot of attention to detail. He was very, very focused in rehearsals. He wasn't j- joking and laughing. And, you know, that type of professionalism is something to be commended and yeah. something to be emulated. So, yeah, I admire that about him. It certainly is. You mentioned Morris Robinson a few minutes ago that uh, Rene Papa, a fellow bass, had stepped in on a coaching where you were working on some <laughs> Russian yeah. repertoire. Yeah. And, of course, the Russian bass repertoire is legendary. And uh, you have something for us sure, yeah. today. <laughs> what, what have you brought to sing? I brought the uh, lullaby from Mazorsky's Songs and Dances of Death. And what is going on in this song? You have a battle basic, basically going back and forth between death and the mother. Uh, mother has a sick child, and the child is, you know, deathly ill. And death is coming in to take over the situation, so to speak. Yeah. Calming the mother down. Hey, don't be so hysterical. I'm here. I'm going to take over this. And she's vehemently fighting against him because she doesn't want you know, her, son to, son, her child to succumb to death. So there's a, you should, if I do this correctly, you hear the inter- interplay between the two characters, uh, the mother being uh, hysterical and death trying to be calming and soothing, more, of a, more, more so saying, hey, chill out. I got the situation under control. Just let me take over and everything will be fine. So... <laughs> In a kind of a sinister way. Oh yeah, but, very Freddy yeah. Krueger like, if you will. All so. right, <laughs> let's get uh, let's get you up uh, by the piano. Myra Huang is your collaborative artist who is seated at the piano. Here is bass Morris Ro- Robinson to sing the lullaby from Mussorgsky's Songs and Dances of Death on Soundcheck here at WNYC. <laughs> Bayou, Bayou, 
Прости, понятно, я лед свой твоею, скупись и радостную. Нет, мир дисон, я не один свой обею. That was the lullaby that opens the songs and dances of death by Modest Mussorgsky. And we heard it sung by bass Morris Robinson today, pianist Myra Huang on soundcheck at 93.9 and WNYC.org. Thanks to both of you. What a chilling performance <laughs> that was. Well, thank you. And that's in the already chilled environment of our <laughs> air conditioned <laughs> studios <laughs> here at WNYC. How are those fingers, Myra? All right? Yeah, they sound great. Um, Oh, I'm just getting over that performance. Oh, That's thank wonderful. you. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, you know, you, you came to opera rather late in your young life. Yes. Are there advantages to not coming to opera earlier? I think that uh, you avoid what could be a burnout. If yeah. you've been to conservatory for four years and grad school for two years and postgrad for two more years, then a program. I think that, you know, the opportunity uh, for burnout is there to set in. Yeah. I also think that because I was settled, because I was uh, not running around and partying and that type of thing, and I, w I had a career and had a job and had a family, um, that I was more settled. I was more focused. I think that that helped me quite a bit because if I were 23 years old, it might not have, you know, I might not have dedicated the type of time and effort into this because you're distracted at that point. Sure. So I think that was a plus for me. Mm -hmm. And the voice is... Uh, you know, a lot more mature at this age. So I kind of, you know, if I were 23, I might be wavering between bass, baritone, and baritone because my voice wasn't quite settled. So now I'm, I'm pretty much a bass, I think. So. No, I think so. <laughs> I think that's pretty safe to say. Right. What What other music do you listen to? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I was Morris Robinson for 30 years before, before I came into the opera world. So I grew up in the hip-hop era. I listened to... Uh, probably 70 to 75 percent R&B and rap. That's just been yeah. my existence for the last 30 years. Uh, the other percentage of time, well, I'll take maybe not that high of a percentage because I listen to a lot of gospel music. I grew up in the Baptist church. I played the drums in the Baptist church. My dad's a Baptist minister. All my sisters sing gospel. My mom sings gospel. So I'm really on that quite a bit too. I like to listen to R&B and jazz. Um, I'm getting really into this new wave, neo soul underground stuff. And, uh, you know, classical music was always something I listened to to relax, something I listened to to... Uh, just for my own enjoyment, but not as much. Nowadays, I find that uh, I'm, I'm noticing some similarities between especially jazz musicians and people that sing songs and sing opera. The, the line, the vocal line, the musical line, the, you know, the expression, it, it, it carries over. It really yeah. does. Yeah. So. Well, you want to stick around and listen to our next guest, jazz pianist Jerry Allen, then. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because she's yeah. phenomenal. Um, and I want to ask you, before we... Uh, we let you go. What do you have coming up? What's on the horizon for you? Well, um, I'm entering my third year, my last year at the Met Young Artist Program. At the Metropolitan Opera, I'm going to be singing the High Priest of Baal and Nabucco for all performances. Mm -hmm. I'll be singing um, the First Nazarene and Zalami for all the performances. And I'm covering the Commendatory in Giovanni, which is a role that I did in Boston my second year of singing. Yeah. I also have Stash Shostakovich's number 14 in Boston, and I have a couple of concerts coming up, so I'm Pretty booked and pretty busy. They're keeping me busy. I was wondering, do yeah. you have time at all to go out and do uh, other engagements away from the Met? Well, the Shostakovich and the, the concert in New England and the concert in South Carolina are all outside engagements. Of yeah. course, we have to go through the Metropolitan Opera uh, because we have to be cleared for those things. I mean, we owe them a certain amount of time, and all mm -hmm. my training is there. I, mean, I, I hate being away from there to be...